Welcome. So thank you all for coming online. This is my first Zoom presentation. I have done multiple presentations before, but the first time online and of course the first time in a pandemic. So this works for all of us and I'm happy you're here. It's the first time I've been able to speak to patients without a mask on for three months. So it's fun for me. It's just a little weird talking to a camera. So bear with us. We're gonna get through this and I'm gonna start. So I threw this one up. Uh, Al Unser Jr. and the Unser family is from where I did my orthopedic training in Albuquerque. And I thought this was clever and funny, but it basically says, dad taught me everything I know. Unfortunately, he didn't teach me everything he knows. And um, the reason I put that up there is our topic today is so big. We literally could spend a whole conference uh, or lecture on almost every topic. So I'm gonna try to touch on a lot of different topics so that we can stimulate some questions and hopefully answer those for you and show you different options you have for treatment. Um, so Al Unser, I just thought this was interesting because uh, you know he's a race car driver, the Unser family, Al Unser Sr. and Jr. were race car drivers in, in Albuquerque. And it almost uh, seemed like he had some humility here. And I thought all racers were like, like Ricky Bobby, but, um, I looked him up and he's actually won the Indy 500 twice. And I thought, well, why is he, why does he have so much humility? And then the reason is his dad won it four times. So his dad apparently did have some things he didn't teach him. So I'm gonna uh, talk about the different options. And when you're talking about minimally invasive treatments, you know, it really starts in clinic and it runs through this list that I've placed here for us. And so I'm gonna talk about each of these, but minimally invasive doesn't necessarily mean just a smaller incision. And so there are different treatment options that can be even outside of surgery that I'm gonna talk about some. And again, hopefully it gets some questions for us. So, you know, to start with nutritional options for treatment of hip or knee pain, that can be literally just a good diet or vitamins or even glucosamine or chondroitin sulfate are food supplements that are sometimes used for arthritis. Um, low impact exercise can be helpful. Weight control is obviously important. Increased stress on a joint because of malalignment or excess weight causes articular cartilage breakdown. There are topical treatments, including um, you know, NSAID creams, there's uh, lidocaine patches. These are things that can help alleviate your pain. Um, many patients are already on Tylenol or anti-inflammatory medications. We also use braces called unloader braces or shoe inserts to help when patients have a malalignment to unload a part of the joint that's arthritic. Physical therapy can be helpful to strengthen the muscles around a joint or to change your posture or to de decrease stress on a, per on a certain portion of the joint. And then getting into more invasive, uh, when you're in the office and you've been determined to have inflammation in your knee, Steroid injections can be very helpful. They definitely decrease pain. They usually only last for several months though. I would say two to three months is probably average. Some of the newer treatments that we have that are definitely less invasive are going to be the joint fluid therapies. And this includes PRP, which stands for platelet rich plasma. There are stem cell injections. Sometimes that's called BMAC. I'll talk about that a little later. There's different types of amniotic fluid injections that can be helpful. And then visco supplements, that's hyaluronic acid. You've probably heard of uh, injections called Synvisc or Monovisc uh, or Duralane, which we use. Those can all be helpful. And I'm gonna discuss them briefly here today. Another new treatment that's actually recently been approved um, with Medicare is a nerve ablation treatment for chronic knee pain. And so obviously if you just have mild knee pain or early arthritis, this isn't a treatment you're going to have, but Dr. Lettington, who works in our office, does do this treatment. Basically, it's a radio frequency ablation of the sensory nerves around the knee to decrease nerve pain. It's especially helpful for pain that we can't resolve with other treatment options um, or we can't figure out. Oh, I wanted to go back. Previous, there we go. And then surgery, we're gonna talk about surgery. And again, minimally invasive treatment could mean uh, a partial knee replacement or um, maybe hip arthroscopy rather than 
hip replacement surgery. That's certainly a minimally invasive option. As far as uh, a smaller incision for a knee replacement or a hip replacement, there's never really been a correlation between improved outcomes just by making a really small incision. And it turned out about 15 years ago, there was a big buzzword on minimally invasive and we were trying to do knee replacements through smaller and smaller incisions. And it turned out if you don't get the vital parts of the surgery right, the patients actually didn't do as well. And so we were trying to make things better, but we actually weren't. So minimally invasive for a knee replacement basically is a incision big enough that we can do everything perfect so that you recover your right, that you recovery right. Um, you know, getting out of the hospital earlier or having a faster recovery has more to do with the techniques we do uh, and implement for the tissues around the knee, the muscles, the tendons. Uh, robotic surgery can help um, by causing a little less damage around the knee when we do the procedure, sometimes a smaller surgery, but mainly it's matching the implant with your ligaments and your anatomy so that the implant uh, so to speak, is placed to adjust to you rather than doing a one-time in surgery where we make you adjust to the implant. Uh, the new robotic techniques allow us to really fine tune how we place these implants so that it matches your anatomy. So it gives you a custom replacement every time we do it. So this is just a little slide about platelet-rich plasma. And it basically um, is a journal um, from 2017 showing that PRP injections were um, actually a little better than hyaluronic acid, which is visco supplement or synvisc, um, and could give improvement all the way out to a year. We do these in the office. It's a fairly simple procedure. The bad part here is the insurance companies haven't caught on yet. They don't quite yet agree with all the data and the data is actually still fairly early, but uh, insurance doesn't cover this. So there's a cash cost for PRP and stem cells. Um, PRP injections are around seven to $800. Stem cell injections, which is a bone marrow aspirate is much more expensive. So this is just another journal report showing that PRP was very helpful all the way out to 12 months um, and um, actually better than hyaluronic acid and steroids that far out. This was just a study comparing BMAC, which is your own bone marrow aspiration compared with PRP. And they both were effective, but it didn't necessarily show one was better than the others. I tend to recommend PRP because it's much easier, a smaller procedure and uh, less cost, uh, but both can be useful. And I would say it, these studies are talking about PRP and BMAC for arthritis, which it is helpful for these type of treatments. And actually we've got different spins we can do on the PRP are also very helpful for tendonitis and bursitis, which is also another minimally invasive treatment we can do for let's say trochanteric bursitis or chronic lateral hip pain. And here's this, this genicular nerve block that I discussed. Um, and again, another journal study just showing that uh, out to six months, patients had meaningful improvement in their pain and function. So this is another option before surgery if you're not a candidate for surgery usually. So I wanted to talk about unicompartment knee arthritis. And the reason is that one form of less invasive surgery is just treating the part that's degenerative or painful in your knee. And so studies have shown that 20% of the time when people are really hurting, only one compartment of their knee. It's usually the medial compartment, but not always. Sometimes it's a lateral compartment. Oftentimes it's the patellofemoral compartment. But 20% um, of these patients only have arthritis or disease in one compartment. And especially now with the robot, we're able to precisely go in and treat just the area that has disease. That allows for a much quicker recovery, a smaller incision. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about that a little more as well. But when you do less surgery, you're basically left with a knee that's more natural and it feels more natural and it functions more natural. Patellofemoral arthroplasty is also a unicompartment knee replacement. It means occasionally patients get severe arthritis just in their patella or their kneecap. 
Uh, and this procedure is also less invasive. You get to keep your weight bearing joint and all your ligaments so it feels much more natural and it, and it gets rid of your pain. This is just a schematic showing what a unit compartment knee replacement looks like. So here, medial joint arthritis where we've got breakdown of the cartilage. This again, showing the schematic of preparing the bone for the new implant, which is basically a new surface. A unit compartment replacement is basically a medial knee resurfacing. So you get a new skid for the femur, a tibial tray with a plastic or polyethylene liner that allows this to glide smoothly and the finished product. These were done with mechanical instruments. I almost always do them with the robotic instruments now. It's just uh, more accurate and actually it is a little less invasive that way. So these are just some studies showing, you know, why a uni versus a total. And a uni is not an option for everybody, but uh, this was a study comparing patients who had a uni on one side and a total on the other. Faster return to motion on the unit compartment, less pain and a more natural feel. Um, shorter hospital stay in this study, um, easier going up and down stairs and higher flexion or better range of motion. Different studies just showing why that might be an option. Um, here's another match study where they looked at unit compartment versus total knee replacements. This is a very large or a powerful study out of England. And again, if you just do the unit compartment replacement, you're more likely to have an excellent um, result, which means you're super happy with your result, um, more likely to be highly satisfied, and there's less complications. So actually, um, DVTs, infections, stiffness, um, and even things like um, pulmon pulmonary embolus or lung issues um, were less likely with a unit compartment replacement. And so, is there a trade-off? You know, if you only do a partial knee replacement, will it last as long as a total? I get this question very often. Um, most of the studies with the new techniques show that a partial knee replacement basically lasts the same as a total knee replacement. It's literally within a percentage point um, of a total knee replacement. So when you look, you know, these are showing 98% studies at 10 years uh, for the survival. Here's one with a partial knee replacement, 84% between 15 and 22 years. And the total knee replacement results are basically in the same ballpark. Um, most of the conglomerate studies are showing very similar results with this. If a medial or a unit compartment knee replacement does wear out and it needs to be changed to a total, usually we can go to standard or primary knee replacement implants um, and don't have to do sort of the larger revision knee replacement implant. So it's a little easier to revise than a total knee replacement. So if you want a unit compartment knee replacement, these are some general guidelines. They're not definitive, but usually it's for 60 years or older. You can do it slightly younger. Um, we have some other options we consider when you're younger. Obviously you want your x-rays to show arthritis in one area and your pain to be in that area. That makes you a better candidate. Osteonecrosis means you happen to have an area or a large cyst in one part of the knee. Um, the rest of the knee is usually normal. And so these are ideal candidates for a unit compartment replacement or resurfacing. You don't wanna have severe deformity to have this procedure. You wanna have actually fairly good motion prior to the surgery. And you don't wanna be really heavy for a partial knee replacement. Oh, I did that again and I'm gonna go back. Also, in general, you want your ACL to be intact. And so sometimes we see patients with unit compartment arthritis and we find out that they've actually torn a ligament inside their knee called the intercruciate ligament when they were young. And that's not a good candidate for a partial knee replacement or some of the other things I might talk about. Those patients would do much better with a more stabilized implant like a total knee replacement. So the summary here is a unit compartment knee arthroplasty is a viable option for patients with unilateral disease. Obviously you gotta select the right patient. You wanna do the right technique and the right design. So the, I use the robot Navio robotic uh, technology, which is out of Smith and Nephew. Um, and the studies there have shown that there's been less need for revisions, more accurate, more accurate alignment and quicker return to sports with the unit compartment knee replacement done with the Navio robotics. 
There is a study here showing a 99.2% survival rate at two years. So that's really good. So sometimes less is more. This is a little video, hopefully it'll work. It's a little bit boring, but it does show uh, what this robot does. I, and it's only a minute or so. So I think it's worth watching. Um, and maybe it'll stem some questions again. So we'll try to watch this. Don't know, can they hear that you think? Oh, they can hear that. Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, this shows during surgery with Navio Robotics, I actually paint the knee with a wand and it shows this 3D model then on the computer. And then I perform the surgery on the computer and make sure that the implant fits the ligaments so that everything is balanced appropriately. Then this little ghost here is me and I'm holding the robotic burr. And so for a partial knee replacement then, we're able to make a small incision the burr knows exactly where it's at and it won't let me color outside the lines. So whatever I planned on the computer is implemented when I go to do the partial knee replacement. So this makes the fit perfect. It makes the alignment um, fit your anatomy and makes the ligament balance appropriate. So we basically can, you know, plan twice before surgery and only cut once and it, and it basically works. So uh, this makes us more accurate. We put in the the new surface on the tibia, the new surface on the femur, it matches your ligaments. And now we have a knee that's moving. Um, I didn't know you weren't gonna hear the video. So uh, hopefully that narrated okay. Can I go to the next one? Here we go. Oh, so um, with Smith and Nephew, that's one of the knees I use. I do other knees, I do um, striker knees often which is how Medica, but they do have a system, this journey knee. So what I just showed you was the journey unicompartment knee replacement. And they do have this family of knee replacements that goes through successive um, portions of invasiveness, meaning they have this XR replacement and they're actually the only company that really has this, but the XR replacement, like a unicompartment replacement, you actually keep your ACL and your PCL. So you keep more of your natural anatomy and you have less replaced anatomy. So this basically, unlike a uni, it does resurface the entire knee, but you get to keep all of your ligaments and all your muscles. So most knee replacements are either cruciate retaining, which is this middle row or um, BCS or posterior stabilized. So cruciate retaining, we actually take out the ACL you keep your PCL and then the function of the implant um, replaces the ACL as best as it can. And it does a reasonable job. It's not like we in general tell patients to play soccer with knee replacements. Um, cruciate substituting means we take out your ACL and your PCL. The function is substituted with this polyethylene post and it does function very well. And for patients with stiff knees um, or who don't have good functioning ligaments, this knee really creates normal motion of the knee, which is nice. It feels normal um, as far as the motion of the knee, but your brain senses what your ligaments can feel. So it never feels completely normal unless you have your ACL and your PCL. Um, it can function very well and it can be non-painful and you can walk and go up and down stairs. But when you really get down to asking patients, well, does it feel normal? Knee replacements don't feel as normal, of course, as your regular knee, uh, although the majority, probably 95%, 98% are very happy they had it done because it makes their pain better. So I was gonna talk briefly about this XR by cruciate retaining knee. I just talked about it a little bit, but this is one that's in, in between. It's, it's very much like a partial replacement, keeps your ACL and your PCL. If you have good ones, this can be an option. Um, if you save the ligaments, again, it, the kinematics are the function of the knee, the way it moves. And it, it basically, the cruciate ligaments drive the way the knee moves when you bend it. And it drives the, what's called the rollback, rollback of the femur on the tibia. Um, and these things are taken up with the plastic when you go to a more uh, advanced, not advanced, but a more constrained implant like cruciate retaining or posterior stabilized. Proprioception means the ligaments in your knee give you feedback to your brain on where your knee is and how you're functioning. So 
when you're kind of doing really aggressive hiking and it's uneven ground, that proprioception makes you more agile. Um, driving the kinematics could give you better motion. And I'm, we're hoping that by decreasing the stress on the implant, we could have increased longevity. Um, that's not yet borne out. We don't know yet for sure. But again, 20%, 25% of patients who have had a total knee replacement can be very happy with their knee replacement. But when you really ask them, well, how does it function? They might say, well, I can't kneel on it. And it doesn't go up and down stairs very well, but at least it doesn't hurt like it did before. So there is some room for improvement on a regular knee replacement. And that's why we look at partials and the XR when it's a possibility. So this is obviously um, a little bit sarcasm, but you know, if you come into the doctor and say, I've got arthritis, and he says, oh, we just need to go in and take out your ACL, you know, that doesn't seem logical. And so the idea of doing and treating a patient for what's wrong by doing a partial or perhaps an XR replacement where we keep your cruciate ligaments, I think is a good option if you're a candidate. And so again, the robot just allows us to match this implant with your anatomy. It allows us to save that center island where your ligaments are, um, where we didn't really used to be able to do that accurately. This is another schematic. I cut it down so it's not as long. Maybe it'll play. Did I skip it? It's not gonna play. It's basically just like the last robotic. Um, although the robot in this case, when you go to do the tibia, instead of just doing, doing one side, you can go to the opposite side um, so that you can resurf the, resurface the entire knee. And so I do talk about that sometimes when you're having a knee replacement, it's really a total knee resurfacing. And I, I compare it to many patients my age now um, have had a cap placed on a tooth. And so to place the cap, you know, you have to prepare the bone make a little room for the cap and then resurface it. And that's really what we do when we do knee replacements. You prepare the bone, make room for the implant and resurface the knee. So we'll go to the next slide. Oh, it's okay. I don't think it's that important. Um, and this, this slide really doesn't have a home. So I put it here, but this is another technology that I do use during surgery at times. This is a company that has a pressure sensor that we can use during surgery to tell if, it, if your ligaments are balanced with your knee. And so if you've ever seen like some of the orthotic sensors you stand on and it shows that there's a lot of pressure medially and not so much laterally, when we're replacing a knee replacement, we can use this sensor during surgery to make sure that there's not excessive tightness um, or excessive laxity uh, during the surgery and that we get the right sized implant to allow your motion. And this can also just make us more accurate. It is a technique that I use, especially when I have to do more aggressive releases on um, very, um, very extreme knees that have you know, significant malalignment. This can be helpful when I'm doing the releases to know when we've had just enough. Obviously, um, I've been doing this for actually probably 23 years now. So if you have experience as well, just feeling and seeing and knowing what's right, but this actually gives you real data that you can use during surgery. It makes you a little more accurate. Again, here's a total knee replacement. Arthritis in both sides. We resurface, we put on the new surface and you've got a knee replacement. So actually at the hospital, we have both the Mako robot and the Navio robot. The Navio, we don't have to do the CT scan because I do the painting during surgery. Um, it's a little bit more mobile. You can move the robot easier. The Mako, you do have to get a pre-op CT scan. Um, it also can do partial and totals and hips. Um, it's a little bit more expensive, but they're both excellent um, robots as far as um, making you more accurate. So the advantages of robotic surgery include more reproduce, reproducible results, a more accurate alignment. And so when we use conventional instruments, if we get within three degrees of what we planned, we think we're doing good. With a robot, we're usually within one degree. So we basically are able to perform what we plan. And what we're finding from the studies is that we're less likely to have to do ligament release during surgery 
to get your knee aligned the way we want. And what that means is, in general, a little less discomfort, possibly a faster recovery. Um, it's not clear yet long-term how the robotic surgeries are gonna do for longevity. We think because we're getting better alignment and better ligament al alignment and function that you're gonna have a longer lasting implant, but it hasn't yet been proven. Um, we have seen some earlier return to motion and discharge from hospital, but these are all actually somewhat preliminary uh, reports. Um, again, a trend towards better range of motion and satisfaction in the midterm and we're not yet certain long-term that we think it's gonna be possible, or possible for a longer lasting implant. So now we're gonna really switch gears on you. Um, I don't know, how's my time doing? I think we're about, about, about halfway through. Perfect. So this is where, I mean, we're, we're gonna to touch on a lot of different things so uh, we can stimulate some questions, but um, you know, I do hip and knee replacements. Um, so I wanted to talk some about hip pain. And another reason is because of the option of doing less invasive surgeries. You know, 20 years ago, we really didn't have many options besides pain relief and then ultimately hip replacements. Um, you know, 50 years ago, we didn't even have really hip replacements or they were just starting and we even did just resection arthroplasties. But so if, you've if you have hip pain, you know, you could have um, osteoarthritis or inflammatory arthritis of your hip. You might have this lateral hip pain, which is often, you know, abductor tendonitis or bursitis. And this is where we're usually treat with therapy or steroid injections, a lot of stretching. Sometimes though, we're using PRP and these other um, biologic injections to help um, the patient heal. Avascular necrosis usually leads to just severe osteoarthritis. Um, that could be very painful. And that's usually diagnosed you know, by x-ray and then MRI. Um, but what I wanted to talk about a little bit is some of the less invasive treatments we can do for hip pain that we're finding more and more about. I've been doing hip arthroscopy for almost 15 years, I believe. We can treat labrum tears. Labrum is the lip of the cup. It's a cartilage lip similar to a meniscus in your knee. We can remove loose fragments or um, pieces that are floating in the hip that could cause catching. And we can treat what's called femoral acetabular impingement. I'm gonna describe this a little more. So this is a schematic showing a hip and a cup. And this is a transverse cross section. But normally the ball is round and it has this waist um, as it comes to the femoral neck. So that when you move the hip, there's a recess that doesn't pinch. If you have a cam lesion, the ball has a bump or a flat spot. And if you've ever been into mechanics, a camshaft of a car looks like this. It's got a long bump on it that actually lifts the valve. And so this type of hip, when you flex it up, the bump will actually pinch into the hip, cause damage to the labrum and the cartilage. A pincer lesion is when you have overhang of the cup. So if you have overgrowth or overhang of the cup and you go to flex the hip, the femoral neck will pinch on the cup. And actually most people when they have this problem have a little bit of both. They have some overhang of the cup and an extra bump. So this just shows the mechanism. Here A and uh, B is pincer impingement, meaning there's overhang of the cup. You flex the hip up and the neck pinches on the cup, it squeezes or squishes the labrum, and it actually causes a little counter stress in the cartilage. Pincer impingement causes pain and labrum bruising. It doesn't always cause arthritis. This cam impingement though, when you flex your hip up, you cause this really high stress. It's like you're trying to squeeze an egg in sideways into a cup, and it causes high stress on the cartilage it tears the labrum off the edge of the bone and it causes delamination and, and arthritis of the joint. And so the reason I'm pointing this out is when patients are younger, if we can treat this cam lesion especially, we may be able to stop this arthritis from even happening. This just shows one of the tests we use to show if patients have impingement or femoral acetabular impingement. It's called the fader flexion adduction internal rotation. Here I, here I am flexing the hip up. 
bringing the knee across the body and internally rotating the hip. It usually hurts right there in the groin. Um, and that's one of the positive tests for impingement. So where does it hurt if you have a labrum tear? And it's always not uh, different than arthritis, but normally uh, it, you know, it can be in the buttock, it can be um, in the anterior thigh, and even down towards the knee. Uh, it can be towards the side of the hip. It's usually a little more anterior lateral thigh or it can be in the groin. And this is the one that's most often, but it doesn't have to be. And so just because you don't have groin pain doesn't mean you might not have labrum pathology. And so a lot of people say, oh, they get sent to me and they're having pain in the buttock and their doctor might tell them, oh, I don't think it's a labrum tear because you're not hurting in the right spot. It's really variable on where patients hurt. And so this was um, a paper by Dr. Gantz. Dr. Gantz is a pioneer of hip pain. Many of the procedures about the hip are uh, named after him because he developed them. But what he said is most, if not all, hip osteoarthritis is secondary, often to subtle but definite and commonly overlooked, ignored or not recognized dysplasia or pistol grip deformities. And so what that means is a lot of patients that get arthritis when they're 50, 60, 70, probably had these changes of femoral acetabular impingement when they were younger. And so 90% of the cases with arthritis, what we find is that those patients do have this mismatch. They either have an overhang of the cup or a cam lesion. And we think that if we can treat these earlier with less invasive procedures, we may be able to prevent the need for the replacement. So treatment for FAI, which is again, this impingement, the gold standard previously was this open hip dislocation and then reshaping. And I've got some x-rays I'm gonna show you, but it was a really big surgery. We had to make a large incision on the side of the hip. We had to do an osteotomy, open up the hip, dislocate it, do the surgery, and then put you back together. That recovery was extremely long. So now I can do that same procedure through the scope. Literally through two one centimeter incisions, I can look into the hip, um, and some traction and some relaxation, I'm able to see the joint, see the labrum, repair the labrum, trim the bone on the acetabulum, trim the bump on the femoral head and neck, and then stop this impingement. So the question then is, could this prevent osteoarthritis? I can tell you, I really do think it can prevent osteoarthritis, not all the time, um, but it's actually more preventative in my mind than like knee arthroscopy when you've got a meniscus tear. Certainly, if you can repair a meniscus, it's likely to help prevent arthritis. Um, but we're not always repairing meniscus when we do knee scopes. Sometimes we're trimming part of the meniscus out. And so if I can prevent some of these problems in the hip, I do think we can prevent some hip um, or at least delay hip replacements in the future. So um, hopefully you can see this, but this is a pre-op x-ray and it shows this cam lesion and the cam lesion means you've got this flat spot and even a bump. And this is a lateral view, which means this is the anterior part of the hip. And so you can imagine if you flex this hip up, just like if you were sitting in a chair, this bump is going to pinch right into the front of the uh, acetabulum. That's gonna cause this repetitive injury to the hip. It's gonna start hurting. It can start catching and popping and causing arthritis. So here, oh, I'm gonna go back again. Here, I like this slide. Um, this patient came to me and had had a previous open treatment for FAI. Unfortunately, he probably got to it too late because he ended up getting severe arthritis in his hip anyway. It shows the screws in the hip because the previous surgery, again, they had to make a cut all the way through the bone, a large incision, open up the hip, dislocate it, try to reshape it and treat the labrum and put it back together. He did get better for a while, but unfortunately still got arthritis in this hip and uh, ultimately ended up with a hip replacement. So here's a left hip um, and it shows here is a large bump or cam lesion or pistol grip deformity that you see on a hip that can pinch into the hip. The joint space here is still preserved. So, you know, if this patient is a young patient, this is somebody I could treat with arthroscopy and very likely prevent the need for a hip replacement. Now in this particular case, if they've already got severe arthritis on this hip or have had a hip replacement on this hip, we'd have to discuss if that's worthwhile doing the hip arthroscopy, but certainly um, 
If this was your only problem, this we can make better and help your pain with a hip scope. Um, same thing, this is just a lateral view showing the bump. This patient does happen to have a fairly large cyst in the acetabulum here. Uh, here, unfortunately, pretty bad arthritis, large bone spurs, loss of joint space on the other hip. So this one's too far gone for hip arthroscopy for sure, and they've already had the treatment for FAI here. This just shows a measurement that we do for femoral acetabular impingement. It's called the alpha angle. The alpha angle measures when you flex your hip up, the femoral neck starts pinching on the cup. And so we find out when is the ball out of a round. And so this angle right here on this particular patient shows about 80 degrees. Well, normally the femoral neck doesn't start pinching. And if I could move this, I'd angle it back down until under 50 degrees. So you usually can flex your hip up much farther before the femoral neck starts pinching into the cup. So this is one of the measurements we look at to see if you're a candidate and if we can improve this cam lesion to make you better with a scope. Here's an MRI of a hip and the, oh, I'm gonna do that again. The MRI shows where the femoral neck has been pinching over and over into the cup. The body's formed a reactive cyst where the patient is getting the conflict or impingement. And this usually does cause pain. When I go in with the hip scope, I'm able to resect all this because it's part of the reshaping of the cam lesion. So what can I do with a scope? You know, I can resect or repair with suture anchors and um, techniques to uh, repair the labrum. I can reattach it to the bone after I've resected the excess of bone. So I can remove excess of bone from the acetabulum. That's called an acetabuloplasty. I can remove excess of bone from the femur or remove that bump, that's a femoroplasty. I can treat some of the arthritis in there by um, trimming some of the cartilage if it's loose, drilling holes in the bone to try to regrow cartilage. We can do some certain types of cartilage transplant or stimulation to try to get healing. And the psoas tendon is sometimes a bad actor inside the hip. It can cause snapping or popping internally in the hip. Um, so intraarticular hip scopes, I can do a lot of this treatment. I also do hip arthroscopy for the lateral hip, which would include you know, um, abductor tendon tears, trochanteric bursitis. Obviously, we usually try these less invasive treatments and therapy and injections, biologic injections, stretching before we're talking about a surgery, but we can do that with a less invasive surgery. Here's a video, we'll see if it plays. Um, this, was, uh, this actually was a patient of mine and um, during the surgery, uh, first we have traction on the hip. When I have traction on the hip, I do the work on the acetabulum and I repair the labrum. We let the traction off. And this shows after the traction is let off, the ball comes into the cup. The ball is kind of kissing up against the labrum. It shows um, right here, actually, here's a suture that I'd repair. This is actually the labrum. I've repaired the labrum to the edge of the cup. This cartilage is actually the shiny cartilage on the femoral head. And this is actually where I've started to do some work on the femoral bump or the femoral plasty. So I'll just try to show this as a minute. Um, so uh, this just shows, you can see part of the bump over here. Here's this burr that I have. I am able to get the burr in place, start trimming and reshaping the burr so that when you flex your hip up, it doesn't pinch into the bone. And again, I can do that through a smaller incision. Um, I'll let this video speak for itself here. Um, but in general, I keep trimming the bone. We check the trimming on x-ray, and then I'm even able to move the hip to make sure that it doesn't pinch when we flex your hip up. Um, after doing all this trimming, again, I've already done the labrum repair. I usually have to do a few stitches in the hip capsule to repair the window that I've opened in order to do this surgery. But that's all done through the scope. So hip replacements, um, you know, we talk about less invasive surgeries, there have been some changes and they are much less invasive than they were 40 years ago. Um, actually in my training, again, which was, I guess, near 23 years ago now when it started, when we did an ingrowth hip, which is 99% of the hips done now, we kept patients on crutches for six weeks to try to let them have their hip ingrow into the, into the femur. And all that's changed now because of a lot of advancements and really because of trial and error in the past, we found out what works and what doesn't work. So what's changed in 40 years? This is kind of fun. So we gotta have a little fun while we're here. 
back in 1979, long hair. Now, longing for hair. Actually, <laughs> so I've had this slide in my deck for years and it didn't used to mean as much as it does to me now. <laughs> if I could do the Johnny Carson deadpan, this would be a perfect time for it. <laughs> Most of us remember Johnny Carson. Um, 1979 keg now, EKG. 1979, we got a nice picture, disco. Now Costco, which actually can be fun. <laughs> and in 1979, we were going to a new hip joint. Now we're receiving a new hip joint. And so I'm gonna talk a little about hip replacements. Things that have improved, we've got better ingrowth technology. So the titanium has a better porous coating on the outside. Um, again, the technology to make that porous coating and make it bone friendly so your bone grows and locks into it much better than it was before. The implants are smaller than they used to be. So smaller incisions to get them to fit, which again means less uh, ligament release, which can mean quicker return to um, activity uh, and usually um, less time in the hospital. Better instruments. At the hospital, I do use the HANA table, which is a special table I use for the anterior hip replacements. It basically helps us position your hip and move it and rotate it so I can get into the front of the hip with a smaller um, incision and um, more accurate, really, um, holding of the hip. So you don't have to have a, somebody or an assistant holding the hip all the time. So this actually has changed a lot, better bearing. So the problem with the initial hip replacements back in the day, we had a metal ball on a plastic liner. The plastic wasn't very good and the ball would wear through the plastic. The plastic particles would cause all sorts of damage inside the hip. And so these hips would wear out, uh, you know, at 10 years and we would get cysts in the bone and have to have revision surgeries. So the bearings are so much better now. We've got the femoral head can be made out of ceramic, which is um, very shiny and polished. So it scratches the plastic less. Auxinium is also a metal that's treated to have a ceramic surface. It also is very shiny, resist, resists scratching. And so it doesn't scratch the plastic. Auxinium happens to not be able to fracture like ceramic, but that's really, really rare with a ceramic head anyway. Crosslink polyethylene has been a huge advancement in the last 10 years. The polyethylene is treated um, actually with radiation and it gets the plastic particles or molecules in the cup and even in the knee replacement to crosslink. And when it crosslinks the molecules, it's like they're holding hands and resisting the stress of the plastic. So they break down and wear much, much less. And so uh, I know Smith and Nephew has FDA approval to say that this bearing, a crosslink poly with an auxinium head will last at least 30 years. And I can tell you that right now in vivo, and they've got 15 to 20 years out, the wear of the polyethylene is really not nearly an issue like it was before. And it's wearing, um, it could last, I think for 50 or more years. Um, ceramic on ceramic is another option. There are a couple drawbacks about ceramic. I think there is, especially when it's on ceramic, occasionally it can squeak. I know that sounds odd, but the, that bearing can squeak. Um, I've seen reports up to as 10% of patients could squeak with the ceramic bearing, but I think it's a little bit less. It usually doesn't hurt, but it's unnerving. Um, and there are some instances where a ceramic bearing, which is like pottery, can crack. And that is a actually a pretty big problem and it requires a, a fairly big surgery. Some of the newer things is this dual mobility. So the larger the ball is, and if it's the same size as your own natural hip, it means it's got better motion and less likely to dislocate. So when hip replacements first came out because polyethylene wore down, we used a really small ball. It was a 22 millimeter head. And it was good because it didn't wear the plastic, but it was more likely to dislocate. And so now because plastic lasts so much longer, we're able to use a thinner plastic much larger head, the, the mobility can actually be as good or better than a natural hip and then not as likely to dislocate as previous hip replacements. And also turns out that an anterior hip replacement is much less likely to dislocate than a posterior hip replacement. Both of them are low. Posterior is probably about one out of 100 and an anterior hip replacement is probably about um, 0.5 or a half a percent, like one out of 200. 
I can tell you, luckily or thankfully, um, I've been doing the anterior hip replacement probably know, six to eight years. I haven't had any anterior hip, I haven't had any dislocations with my anterior hip. So I've been really happy with that approach in the HANA table. Larger heads, we talked about that. Um, better therapy and joint replacement programs means that we can do outpatient surgeries. And so this is definitely happening. I know you guys might have some questions about that, but it's really um, expectations, therapy, and then pain relief programs and anesthesia that get patients out of the hospital quicker. Um, we talked about anterior and posterior approaches. I don't want to demonize posterior because it's not a bad procedure. I still do them on patients when I don't think they're a candidate for an anterior and some of my revisions I do posterior. The results are very, very good with posterior. I just think they're better and a little quicker out of the hospital with anterior. There is some literature though that shows that they're equal. Um, there's not really a lot showing that one's better than the other, but I can say anecdotally, I, I think anterior is better. Navigation or robotic assistance. Uh, we've talked about that. This isn't used in the hip as much as the knee, but it's also used in the hip. We use x-ray or certain types of robotic um, or computer assistance to check with leg links. Um, the MAKO can help with placing the cup in a hip replacement. I think the advantages are a little less for robotics and hip replacement surgeries now than they are with um, knee replacements. Wow, we have come to the end. And so I'll try to answer your questions. One, I do treat knees that you know don't require a total knee replacement. So there's all sorts of treatments, including arthroscopic ligament repairs and meniscus repairs. So a knee that pops out can sometimes be a patella that pops out of place. There are definitely procedures for that. Um, occasionally, it can be the knee actually popping out or a feeling like it pops out because of the meniscus. Um, it's unclear if that's arthritis, but there are lots of treatments for what you're describing probably not knee replacements, but basically you need an exam and an x-ray and we can do that here um, in the office. You might need an MRI, but not always. Um, you know, patella dislocation treatments include a ligament reconstruction that prevents the kneecap from dislocating. There are some bone osteotomies where we change the alignment to get things better. So there's lots of different treatments. Um, so I'd have to see you. So um, please come in. <laughs> All this technology is new. And what I would say the literature shows right now is that it, it does help pain. There has not been enough definitive um, literature for insurance companies to jump on board. So they're not paying for it yet. I mean, the, the large body of literature probably, I, I think does show that it works, but insurance companies, I think don't, don't wanna pay regardless. Um, so it does help pain. I think the expectations though, that you're gonna get a shot and that your x-ray will look like it did 20 years ago and that you will feel like you did 20 years ago, that expectation won't happen. But the PRP or the stem cells, it changes the environment inside your knee and it, it changes the environment to a knee that thinks it's in homeostasis, which means it's, it's stable rather than something that's painful and inflamed. And so it definitely can decrease pain. Um, fortunately, there's no guarantees for how long it could last. I think I've seen, I've seen improvement for a year. I've seen studies showing improvement out to two years before, um, but you will get a patient that maybe only gets improvement for three weeks. And so it's, it's not quite um, completed yet as far as the body of literature that we need to figure out how to make this work best for patients, but I do know it helps pain. Yeah, so um, there is all sorts of uh, treatments like that. And one of them um, is actually done occasionally before knee replacements where you get a numbing in injection around the knee to help with your pain after surgery. And so the literature on that, which is really the same as the knee ablation treatment, um, shows that um, you would need less narcotics after a knee replacement. So it definitely helps pain, but it doesn't make your knee completely numb. And so what I can say is the literature definitely shows improvement in knee 
um, function scores and questionnaires that patients um, fill out showing what their function is in their knee and how much pain they're having. Um, as far as, you know, getting the injection and saying, well, my knee, again, I don't have arthritis anymore because I had the shot. That probably wouldn't help or wouldn't be that definitive. But as far as saying, well, yeah, now I can go and go on a walk and it's not hurting like it was and I'm sleeping better. And uh, that can definitely happen. Um, and certain patients, I think, are good candidates for this. Not always. Um, if you're a candidate for a procedure, the ablation treatment um, may not be the first option for you. We might try some other things. Obviously, you wouldn't, you know, if you wanted to avoid a surgery, that is definitely an option, and that'd be something we would consider and have you see Dr. Lightington for. Um, you know, a cam lesion actually can become a bone spur. And so, um, so patients can get arthritis in their hip, like if they have rheumatoid arthritis. And if they've got bad rheumatoid arthritis, you can develop large bone spurs. Those aren't spurs that um, if you remove them, your hip would feel better because the spurs are the result of the severe degeneration in your hip. So if you have the bump or the spur first and it causes the degeneration, so you know we can treat the spur first and it may prevent the, the hip from getting worse. If you have bad arthritis for other reasons, sometimes it's just genetic, like your folks happen to have bad arthritis or it's a different form of arthritis, then treating a spur isn't as helpful with the scope. It, it, it wouldn't give you long lasting improvement. So you definitely need an expert to look at your x-rays and your exam to know if you're a candidate for a hip scope or for hip replacement. Usually staying active is better. Um, low impact exercise is obviously best. And so if you're getting quite a bit of pain when you walk a long ways, you may start wanna alt alternating, you know, spinning or swimming or elliptical um, exercises so you're not getting quite as much impact but you never want to stop walking. Um, and so I would walk, if you have to decrease those miles some, that's okay, or you know the length, and maybe do some of these other options like we discussed. There are occasions when patients are allergic to metal. Um, it's usually chrome, or cobalt, or stainless steel. And I would say that most of the knee replacements on the market are made out of stainless steel. That, that femoral resurfacing is stainless steel. The percentage of people though that are actually allergic to metal is really small, but it's out there. And I've seen patients that, you know, get itchy if they wear a ring or an earring or can't wear watches. And I have done revisions on patients that had pain in their knee because they were allergic to their implant. I think it's very rare, but it is something you have to be aware of. The auxinium implant, which Smith and Nephew makes is, um, uh, is made out of a material that is hypoallergenic and it doesn't have the chrome and the cobalt in, in it that causes uh, a allergic reaction. So that's the one that's used when people have allergies. That's the one that I use very often with knee replacements. <laughs> 